This is the fourth day of the November 86 retreat. Several questions have come up in connection with the talks of the last two days. Talks about the me and its relationships. One question that frequently arises is, why am I so attached to this self-image? Why this incredibly strong attachment to it? And another one is, why do I feel that I am identified with this body, that I am this body? That body is, this body is my body and mind. One could also ask, in, in this connection, why is one so attached to the idea that one is an individual? Even to question it seems almost heretical. Our whole social mores in the Western world are based on being individuals more or less rugged. We talked a little bit in previously how this image comes to be, or the, the hosts of images that we have about ourselves, from how we are felt about by our parents, and talked about and addressed, spoken to lovingly, affectionately or sternly, disapprovingly. and then by our teachers, and how one begins to live up to these images, whether one is actually like that or not. When the image tells one how one is and one lives. When th there is a power of direction in this image. Either to spur one on to be to keep that way to get better. In, in school there's the image of one and the parents hold the same image that one is brilliant, promising. And this image spurs the child to achieve better grades, more uh, acknowledgement, and do better work. Conversely, the image that one is no good, not talented, not as good as the others or the brothers or sisters, has that same power of blocking one in one's performance. 
just a memory comes to mind, the, the image that I've had and been also given that I have no mechanical talent. Keep your hands off of this. You don't have any mechanical <laughs> talent. So even up till now, every once in a while, when the typewriter doesn't work, I may look. The first feeling is I have no talent, and therefore I don't look at how something functions. The first time this struck me that I too can look at something was a, a revelation. I haven't done much with it. <laughs> it's sometimes very convenient <laughs> to live up to an image and let the others do it. <laughs> In observing Kyle, my husband, who has this image of himself being <coughs> technically, mechanically minded, and observing him at times, I notice that he's not doing any magic, he's just looking at something. How, how does it function? He's observing it, watching it. Sometimes I get impatient, I feel he should fix this thing. <laughs> <coughs> not just observe it. If a child is told that she or he is clumsy, very rarely will the child be able to develop skills unless the image changes. So, we think we are what others tell us that we are. And, of course, we also gather images from our reading, stories. There are heroes and heroines who uh, seem so uh, admirable. And we imitate that. We want to be like that. Or the, all the, the media stars. Wanting to look like them, act like them, move like them. There's this terrific movie, was a video showed here once. Sometimes we look at videos here. Video, VHS, you know. I don't remember the name, it was Sam, the name Sam was in the title. Play it again. Play it again, Sam. Was that with Humphrey Bogart? Yeah. yeah. Woody Allen, yeah. How Woody, I uh, know, Humphrey Bogart was the mentor of this man, how to, to behave, how to look at this moment, because he didn't bring it off, it was a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> but the process happens, how to look at a woman or at a man, <laughs> It's not so natural, as natural as we think it is. We've learned that. How to strut about in front of the other sex, or the same sex. Languishing looks, languishing looks. The whole flirtatiousness is not as natural as we like to believe. We're imitating what we've seen on the screen and in others for years and years and years, looking for models, or being affected by models, whether we look for them or not. This is me, all of these learned images and learned ways that come out of the image. Why, the person says, why this attachment to this, to this image? I 
I don't know either. One has to watch it. Not just engage in explanations, because then that relieves us to watch it, to, from watching it. Somebody has explained why it is, a psychologist or uh, whoever, and now we can live with that explanation and we don't have to look. But if, we, if this question is real, vital to explore, we have to look at the moment that the image is threatened or flattered, boosted. And that's the moment when we don't want to look, when, when we're engaged in the emotion that has arisen, swamped by it flooded by it, by the emotion that is aroused when somebody kicks the image, hurts it, offends it, slights it, criticizes it, puts it down. At, the, at that moment, all the air goes out of the balloon. Is left with, well, you know what we're left with when the air is out of the balloon. Not much. And the pain of it. At that moment, attachment to image is manifested. It's there. It, it's, it's palpable. It's, one can feel it indirectly from the pain of the image being hurt. And then maybe seeking out someone who will put it back together again. Because the boost to the image is a very pleasurable experience. It feels good, it feels energizing, it is addicting. to be looked at with interest by men or women who are attractive to one gives a tremendous boost to the self-image. And that is as addicting as good food or whatever, drugs. One craves that. It does one good. It gives one a sense of, of, of living, being alive. The relationship in which one may find oneself already may not have this mutual boosting of images. Husbands and wives or people who live together usually don't go around boosting each other's images, saying how terrific they are, or how, how lovable, how beautiful attractive or sexy or whatever, that, that goes by the wayside very soon. And other things happen when witnesses each other's bad moods, irritations, or criticism why the laundry hasn't been done or the dishes are still in the sink, or just the, the working spouse or both working spouses returning exhausted from work, feeling to relax, not to talk, walk around attractively. <laughs> Which is the thing that that then is missing, that one then sees in someone else. And then there comes the energy and the boost and the good feelings, and there is where all of one's tendencies go. I want to be with that person who, who does this to me. When we don't think that clearly, usually. We, we, we couch it in romantic terms. Of, this is where I could really love or be loved. Is that so? I'm not putting out a theory. I'm talking to many people, and I'm also looking. But everyone has to look for himself, herself, 
as it happens in relationship, what this self, the power of this self-image is, and how addicting it is. I knew a quite famous scientist who had all the recognition, honors, appreciation, publications, and so forth that one could hope for. And yet there was a craving for more recognition. When, whenever his birthday occurred and the letters and telegrams and flower pots poured in, <laughs> he was very aware that so-and-so had not written yet, or that journal had not yet brought uh, an article about him, 60th birthday or 70th. And when it happened, that was read, and copies made and sent to the relatives and friends, as of the medals that were received, they were not only displayed very visibly, but there were photos made and sent to the relatives. And yet there was never satisfaction. It was an insatiable need. Later on, as this thing abated, there was retirement, sickness, moving to another place. That person took his life. When the stuff from the outside was no longer coming, that was no longer, that well no longer flowing, there was nothing left inside. Nothing worth living for. The demands of self-image were unheard, uncatered to, untaken care of. Why the attachment? Is this is this where we get our joie de vivre from our self-image and how it is being? <clears throat> Boosted? Is, is that why, how we enjoy living? This is where our enjoyment, our, our delights come from? Is this all we know? Very often in the, in the self-image, a change has taken place. People report this frequently, that as a young child, one was treated as just so much worthlessness by the parents, not at all given any credit for anything. The, the sisters or the brothers were the ones who got it. <clears throat> and one went without sort of a real deficiency disease setting in, and then for some reason, not living up to this image, but making up one's mind, I'm going to change that, I'm going to achieve and accomplish, and working for it as it feels on one's own, without support by the parents or the early teachers, working hard at school and, and achieving, and gradually getting this appreciation. The admiration, or the grades, the success. Maybe acquiring knowledge, acquiring skill, and uh, succeeding in it, succeeding in business. And the new image now being guarded for fear that if that is harmed, hurt or let go of, 
here, maybe in this work, then I'll, I'm back to the old one. And how that feels, I know. I don't want to ever go back to, to that. Do you, do you see the assumptions that the brain is making? That a good image is better than a poor image? It, it sure feels better. But it's no better. It's an image. It's isolation. Enclosure. Being on guard. Protecting it. Being identified with it and one's life depending on this. And then the assumption that if I let go of this one, a bad one will come and stay. <laughs> How does one know? On what, on what does one base this assumption? Actually, if one has suffered from the effects of a, a bad image, being unpopular or worthless, no good, I, th I think the, the craving power of the new images is that much stronger. All the, the, the suffering of earlier years the energy of that now goes into the craving for supporting and enhancing and strengthening this new image. We talked about the, this mechanism of the reservoir of hurt. Being alive, being reactive, wanting its just do. So we're, we're always coming to this question, is this what I am, my images, the images that are there in the brain and connected with strong, potent physical feelings, emotions, sensations? Is that what I am? It certainly feels that way, doesn't it? That the feeling runs deep. And the holding on to it runs deep because we are, we do want to survive. As a, as a physical organism, we're conditioned to, to want to survive. The brain is conditioned to keep this organism alive, surviving. We're part of a whole uh, family of, of living organisms in which this tremendous drive or power, momentum to survive is, is there, it's programmed into us. And the brain uses its same mechanisms of keeping alive the image. It doesn't differentiate whether it's real or not. No, but anyway, it seems real. We all feel it's real at one time or another. My image is me. When, I'm flat, when the image is flattered, I feel flattered. Or does one see at that moment that it's an image that is responding either this way through inflation or dejection? If that is seen at the instant it happens, what happens? We have to find out for ourselves. Maybe afraid to. So many people tell me I don't want to look at that. I'm afraid. Falling apart or losing what I seem to need for living. The pleasures of images.
if one doesn't look, one won't see. One will stick with the image. And whether the image is one of being of excellence or of being of no good, it's isolating. It takes care of this human isolation very well. I am this way, the others are that way. Either arrogance or the opposite. Feelings of inferiority, not being part of the whole. The others being so much different, so much worse or so much better. When one starts opening this whole thing up and looking, one comes upon these insights. One cannot help but come upon these insights. <coughs> if the questioning is serious, because one has seen the, the pain, has felt the pain in oneself and others, the isolation of image, imagery, that imagery causes in one, having to get to the top of a, of a business or a church. What friends does one have left? They're all rivals, they're all sort of enemies. Or in the sports, you remember last, last Olympic Games when a woman who had idolized the, the runner, they were, they were running, she had pictures of her all over her walls in her room, and here she was finding herself in the, in the same running with this woman and they kicked each other or tripped each other. I think we could go on with examples and Another one comes up, if one performs, remember, he used to do some performing, singing. As long as that image was there, the musical performance was mediocre. Only when the image would not be there could the music do its, its own thing. And even if that was so during the performance, afterwards, just like that scientist collecting remarks from people, how well one did, and so forth. And maybe waiting for a little review in the paper and reading it over and over again. How long can one read a review? How long do people stick around after a concert? to talk to, and after, after a while they go, and then one is left, and the review has also been read, and then what? Another concert, another performance. Or <coughs> and the comparisons with better reviews for others, and the pain of it. And the isolation, the envy and jealousy. And we can't say it's only in certain people. I think it's in all of us. Because we all share the same brain, the same consciousness. With that we're coming to the, to the question of are we individuals as we like to think we are, meaning unique, special. <clears throat> as I said before, it's almost sacrilegious to, to question that, isn't it? And yet we're 
Where do we have our opinions and ideas and knowledge from? Except from, from others, from the pool of opinions, the pool of ideas and the pool of knowledge that has been growing and added to and, and changed and modified over centuries and thousands of years to that we're heir, either through acquisition or through inheritance. Was a, a genius like Mozart, an individual? Did he own this musical capacity? Or was this a high breeding of talent? I can't. I can't put it into technical terms, I'm not familiar with that part of science which deals with inheritance. don't even know whether that's the right word, I only know the German word. Or Einstein. Or is it that here and there in a human brain, through the, the laws of inheritance and combination of genes and chromosomes, some something pops up, genius, a tremendous constellation in the, in the brain. Out of, the, out of the whole pool of inheritance of genes and chromosomes, parents, grandparents, and all intertwined, we are all intertwined, our genes and chromosomes. Even though each individual is unique in physio physiology, anatomy, or the particular combination of genes, I don't think they are two alike. In that respect, each one is different. But we're all different, as we share that. The fact that we're all different is common to us all. And our training, our, the, our socio-economic environment, our political opinions, religious ideas and convictions and beliefs. Where do we, all, where do we get it from? But from everyone with whom we're, we're living. <laughs> what is unique about that? About the programs that have been installed or installed themselves in this brain. If we begin to observe our reactions and behavior, we, we find how amazingly programmed our reactions are. They're so mechanical, so automatic, so instantaneous. So much like, and we talked about this at length, so much like my mom used to react, or my father, or my so-and-so. Yet, in the midst of this saying, this is me, and the attachment to this me. Is one it just saying to, to differentiate this set of reactions and ways and behavior and so forth from that? Or is there attachment? One is factual. The other is not. The other is ridden with emotions and anxieties of, and, and, and fears and hopes.
just as one asks, why am I so attached to images of myself? I can ask, why am I so attached to my opinions, my points of view, my beliefs, my knowledge? It's all part of that image. And it's part of me. I mean, if, if we're together talking and I put an opinion out, somebody puts an opinion out, then it's as though it was defending one's own life. One is identified with the opinion. One may even see it doesn't quite hold, but one may stick to it because it's me I'm defending. Does this have to be like that? One can ask that and if one becomes aware of this, really becomes aware of it, what's going on, then one can drop that tenacious holding on to image and opinion. At least one can question, do I have to hold on to that? How ridiculous. with the emptying out of that, then the separation goes. With the flowing in again, energy into the image, the separation is reinstated. Me versus you, mine. something and, and playing games used, used to puzzle me for quite a while. My parents were into playing games at night. Family had to do something together. And there were a card game and also a, a certain dice game. Not gambling, we weren't gambling. And I would be amazed how There was this tremendous attachment to how these little things rolled. It had nothing to do with any of us. And the competition and, and even upset of... I want to mention names. <laughs> if one person would win and the other one would lose. And then I have to have another one to see whether this time I can win. Identifying with dice. That's me there, the, the, the role. Or the, the cards. Now, sometimes with cards, there's some skill involved, some intelligence, or let's say remembrance. And uh, one prides oneself if one can remember all the hands and bridge that were played from the beginning and so forth. But rolling dice has, has, not, not, has nothing to do with talent, nothing really to identify with except these little things. And we do it. And we feel, feel happy when we win. <laughs> and if you don't feel happy when you win, then you're not really so fascinated by the game and you're a poor sport or something. <laughs> you know, fun to play with. Will we, will we watch it? Next time? That's hurt. Or the, the rush of, of energy from being liked, looked at approvingly or desiringly. <coughs> will we watch it? Not watch out, it's dangerous, but, but see what happens. Out of interest. We're here, we're, we're, we're looking at this stuff. We're, we're, we're doing this kind of work. How, how far are we going to take it? I think that's a good question.
how far we're going to go with it. Up to a point and then no more looking, leaving things untouched which are too threatening to, to interfere with or to observe, because observance is interference. If a, if a tremendous drive going and one watches it, the, the energy changes. talked about it the other day with someone. And I think he used to talk about it before meals at, in, in earlier retreats, how when there's hunger, the, the factual situation is the blood sugar is down, maybe a little trembling, a feeling of weakness. And, of course, the associated idea of food, that, that, this is associated with food, this feeling. But if food isn't there, it's not dinner time yet, then is the fantasy playing with the foods, seeing all these beautiful dishes, and the mouth actually waters when it has to begin swallowing. And not just seeing the foods, but seeing oneself eating them. It adds to the zest, to the, to the zest of the fantasy. <coughs> or can one watch hunger without the energies going into the fantasy channel of eating food? watching hunger. And not calling it hunger, because that's too much of a concept. It has too many ideas associated with it. Watching what, what is there and has a tremendous driving force. Now being just been with. And then the the, the energy of attention and the energy of the driving force are not two different energies anymore. There's one energy gathering in, in awareness. In connection with this, another question that often comes up is, can I really trust myself to do this work? Or can I really trust another in relationship? So, is it worthwhile looking at what we mean when we ask for trust. Trusting the other, the other will be faithful or will uh, behave in a certain way which I expect and want. Trusting myself to be as I know myself to be now or as I want to be. Isn't, tr isn't this trust in oneself and in others also connected with image? Trusting that he or she will be as I want her to be, the image of him or her, to continue for my sake really, for my security, satisfaction, fulfillment.
How, how can one trust an image? And since, or if, we are all beset by images, how can we trust each other? Because images may change. Circumstances may change and the image changes. The desires, the wants, change with changing images. How can one trust that system? I think it's untrustworthy. The me, the self, wants to trust itself. How absurd. It is fickle, it's made up of past experiences, remembrances, ideas, subject to influence from the outside and from the inside. I can't trust my me any more than I can trust your me. Why should I? If I do, I'm in for disappointment and anger, grief. Or temporary satisfaction if it happens to turn out the way I hoped it would. There is no clear seeing, there is no intelligence not meaning the intelligence of thinking, but the intelligence of seeing clearly. That's only there when the me does not interfere with its images and ideas and knowledge and so forth. Then the, the, the view is open, unobstructed and clear. And that needs no trust. It, 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 it functions. It functions wherever the me is out of the way, does not interfere. But the me does not see clearly. It sees according to what it wants, according to its images. And therefore it cannot possibly be trusted. Is that, is that true? All our disappointments chronicled in poems and drama, plays. How could she do that to me? How could he have done that to me? Leave me for another. One trusted an image. And the image is not the real person. What is the real person? What am I? without images. Will we ask that and watch the images? Not to project a state of me without images and then strive for that, that's a new image. But 
questioning, what am I without images? And not withdrawing in fright. Because there may be something horrible expecting me. You don't know. This, this word, this work, <clears throat> is taking risks. The risk of not knowing. Not acting on known assumptions which may be completely fallacious. Please, I did not say, get rid of your images. But what am I without images? I don't know. I have to watch what I am. What I think I am. And that I watch sitting alone and in relationship. Two go hand in hand. And this question, which can always be there, does it have to be this way? Does this habit have to go on? Maybe it doesn't. One has to find out. In stillness. We will end here for today.